Okay. Do you want me to read from the Bible? Do you want me to read from the Bible, Maria? Yeah. What do you have prepared? What's it about? Well, this is about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee who belonged to the Sanhedrin. And that means he was a uh, theologian who understood Mosaic Law. And he was one of the leaders in Israel when Jesus was walking the earth. But Nicodemus thought that he recognized some truth in what Christ was saying. So he went to meet with Christ at night when the other Pharisees didn't know because he wanted to see what he could find out about uh, Jesus. I forgot my glasses. Give me your glasses. Whoa. Does that help or help? I'm seasick. Do you want me to read it? Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit give birth, gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? So Nicodemus was, Nicodemus knew the Bible, the uh, Old Testament. He knew, uh, he was knowledgeable about those things, but he didn't understand it, man. He didn't understand what was going on. This was a revolutionary concept. Now I'm reading a, a uh, uh, explanation of this. This was a revolutionary concept. The kingdom is personal not national or eth ethnic. And its entrance requirements are repentance and spiritual rebirth. Jesus later taught that God's kingdom has already begun in the hearts of believers. It will be fully realized when Jesus returns again to judge the world and abolish evil forever. So Nicodemus was so concerned with his uh, his knowledge that he had he had missed the point. You know, the Jews were looking for a Messiah that was going to lead them out of Roman rule, and they were looking for a warrior savior, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger, who just showed up and was able to amass armies to conquer all of Israel's foes, and that was their idea of a Messiah. God's idea of a Messiah was someone that could conquer death. And they missed it completely. But Nicodemus was on to something. He was, he was looking into this. So Jesus had just said, you, you're, you're Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How will you then believe when I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now that's when Moses lifted up that bronze snake and um, 
the Israelites were wandering in the desert, and God sent a plague of snakes to punish the people for the rebellious for, for rebellious attitudes. Those doomed to die from snake bite could be healed by obeying God's con command to look up at the elevated bronze snake and by believing that God would heal them. If they did, similarly our, our salvation happens when we look up to Jesus believing He will save us. God has provided this way for us to be healed. So, Jesus is referring to Moses because that's what Nicodemus understood. He understood Mosaic law. So he's saying, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in that, in him, may have eternal life. Jesus had a way of speaking in parables, Marion. He loved to give people illustrations so they could clearly understand. Now here's the verse that uh, next comes out of Jesus' mouth, which is the, the keystone to the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So here Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. But Jesus is still alive when he's saying this. But you can see the way he's saying this infers that he's been given. He's been given. So this is kind of prophetic but in a quiet way, which is how Jesus did it. The people around Jesus didn't even know He was going to the cross until it happened. And yet Jesus was talking about it even here. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. So, it's, it's simple, Miriam. Christ came into this world that we'd have a way to be with God. It's not some complicated formula. It's not, it's not a, uh, a test of uh, performance. It's not about how, how much good you do in performance terms versus how much good you do in faith terms. You have to start with a belief that Christ died for your sins. As long as we believe that Christ had a purpose in His life, that He died, and we accept that purpose as a uh, exchange for our sins, we accept that as something that's been done to help us in our relationship with God. We accept that as a real work, a sacrificial work, when we accept that and we turn our ways away from our old life, or away from our sinful nature, when we accept that and we change our ways and we begin to begin to perform through that, the performance then becomes a result of our faith in Christ, of a willingness to receive His work, of a willingness to be changed by that. That's when performance begins. That's when performance becomes important. That's that saying that we talked about last week. That uh, it's not through works lest any man boast. Because then we're belittling what Christ did on the cross. We can't, we can't get to heaven on our own. We have to get there through receiving Christ's work. And once we do that, Miriam, 
everything falls into place. Our works become natural. Our works become something we do joyfully, not out of a, a, a guilt-ridden, uh, performance-based uh, uh, procedure. So, Miriam, I know you understand this, and I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord that, that you're, uh, you've lived a, a good life. And I'm thankful that He put you in my path, in our path. And we just continue to pray that your path from here on in would be easier. We know you're, 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 uh, you're struggling with your, your health and your situation here. But we know because of your faith it's going to be easier. And you need to know that too, Mary. You really don't have anything to worry about at this point. You just have to go see the Lord, your Maker, and enjoy your, your time to be with Him. Lord, let's just, uh, let me just pray here. Father, I thank You so much for Miriam's uh, life with us, Lord. And thank You so much for uh, her testimony throughout that life that uh, has been so uh, filled with uh, Your truth. Lord, her gentle, calm way, her steady uh, friendship with those around her, her uh, willingness to help those that uh, come across her path. Lord, we thank you for everything and realize that that's just an extension of your love in her. And Father, we just ask that you would uh, embrace Miriam right now, Lord, and, and, and keep her uh, at peace. Uh, physically and spiritually, Lord, just cuddle her and, and uh, remind her that you're her father and everything's been taken care of and uh, continue to, to protect her and uh, these last uh, few moments on earth, Lord, whether it's a few days or a few months or a few years even, Lord, we ask that you be with her consistently through that time, Lord, and just continue to to grow her uh, faith in you and her strength in you and help her to uh, uh, be a, an, an influence to those around her. Lord, did you want to say anything? Yeah. Dear Lord, I thank you for um, your daughter, Miriam. She is your daughter, and I'm praying that you take her home to be with you soon. Uh, I can see she's struggling and she's trying to get there. Uh, I think the timing is near. But I thank you for her life. I thank you for the shining light she has to, to others, and is to others. I always remember her, her jokes, and she was always quick with the a joke to make everyone laugh, and um, she took pleasure in making other people happy. She was caring and um, always uh, concerned for others, and um, I just find it hard to see her struggling here, Lord, but I'm going to ask that you be with her. and. Make her transition easy and she can find you in the, in the light. And that she'll regain a perfect body and see all her friends and have them and that she'll be with you soon. And that will be your will. Uh, all in your timing, Lord. But please help her transition to be easy and comfortable for her. And for, for those of us that care about her too. And, um, I just thank you for, for who she is and who you made her be and all her gifts and talents and um, just uh, everything she's meant to everybody, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.